Good morning and welcome. Welcome to worship for this Sunday, March 7th, the third Sunday in Lent. In old days, in Latin, they would call it Oculi Sunday, after a phrase from Psalm 25, but we don't need to focus on that. Our focus today is on foolishness and the foolishness of the cross and how God uses methods that we might think as foolish to bring about extraordinary things. So we're glad you'll be along with us this day as we explore that theme. The order of service is found right there on your screen, so simply follow along as you begin your day and your week with God. Let us begin. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sin to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now hear from our choir. Amen. First reading this day is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and our sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our Lenten verse. Return to the Lord our God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to John chapter 2. Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken forty-six years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our sermon hymn this day is, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, Oh, the Wonderful Cross. The old hymn with a little twist in it. Let's see if you can sing along with it. When I survey the wondrous cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast 
save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, all who gather here by grace draw near and bless his name. See from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flowed mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? O'er thorns compose so rich a crown. O oh, the wonderful cross, O oh, the wonderful cross, bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. O oh, the wonderful cross, Oh, the wonderful cross, all who gather here by grace draw near and bless his name. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a tribute far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Oh, the wonderful cross, Oh, the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. Oh, the wonderful cross, oh, the wonderful cross, all who gather here by grace draw near and bless his name, bless his name. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, St. Paul writes, quoting the prophet Isaiah. And the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. How do you win a war? How is a war won? How was World War II won? Well, it was won by hard work, by, vic by, by struggles, by battles, by brute force. Guadalcanal, Normandy, turning points. Normandy, they stormed the beaches there, invading the German front, German-occupied Europe, turning point to the end of the war. And it was hard, and many people lost their lives, but many of the enemy lost their lives too. And that's how war is won. Good strategy going into battles. Any military historian, or even non-military historian, will tell you that. We didn't do quite as well in Vietnam because we weren't as prepared strategically to go up against the Viet Cong. And there were other factors at play too, including some on the home front. In the Pacific Theater, my grandfather fought there at the tail end of the war and into the occupation of Japan. We won 
by two big booms, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Brute force, killing your enemy, that's how you win wars. That's a self-evident truth, isn't it? Anyone can tell you that. That's the wise way to win a war. But what if General MacArthur or General Eisenhower had marched into Tokyo or Berlin and offered Hideki Tojo or Adolf Hitler a handshake and a hug and said, oh, let's just make peace? That wouldn't have worked. That, of course, wouldn't have worked because certainly Adolf Hitler and Tojo, too, were uniquely evil men. They needed to be defeated in essentially total war. That battle is small potatoes. That war is small potatoes compared to the great cosmic war that has been being fought since the beginning of time. It's a war that we know the end result of, but still, World War II, Vietnam, Iraq, Korea, World War I, Civil War, Spanish-American War, the War of the Roses, you go back far enough. Small potatoes compared to the battle between life and death, darkness and light, good and evil, heaven and hell, God and the devil. That battle has been waging ever since Lucifer, that greatest of all angels that God created, the bearer of light, chose to rebel against against God before the dawn of time itself. At that moment, Satan had already lost the war. But that doesn't mean that he wouldn't still keep fighting battles. But God had something else in plan, and that plan was totally and completely foolish. Because that plan would involve sending in one soldier, and not a great and powerful archangel, not Michael, not Gabriel, not the cherubim or the seraphim, not all the heavenly hosts, but one man. With sandals, kind of looking a little bit wild. One man who would die. Not a pleasant death, not a death that you look and say, oh my goodness, he's a hero, but what would look to everyone else a painful, torturous death. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? death on the cross. How is this good enough to defeat any enemy, let yet alone God's oldest enemy? I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, Isaiah writes and St. Paul quotes, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. God uses something and a mechanism that looks like foolishness to everyone else to win that eternal battle. But the foolishness does not start, and for the foolishness, ultimately, it finds its culmination in the cross, but there is other foolishness along the way. First of all, why the battle would even be fought? Who is it fought over? It's fought over you and me. We, poor, miserable sinners, mortal human beings, the apex of God's creation, yes, but in the grand scheme of things, is one individual soul that great, that important? Is one individual soul worth God waging a war, an all-out war against the devil that would send his only son to his death? Is that war worth fighting? We wouldn't go to total war to save one person. We'd feel bad about that one person, sure. But we wouldn't send 
someone, we wouldn't send armies to their deaths over one person. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. A work of foolishness on a cross. An act of foolishness to save people in open rebellion against God, people who did not love God. And how is that, how are those benefits made applicable to us? Do we have to work to get them? Do we have to strap on our army boots and go to divine basic training in order to fight this war and win our salvation and win our freedom? No, it's another foolish thing. We are saved because we believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's a foolish way. It's a foolish religion, this Christianity, isn't it? Because unlike other religions, unlike other faiths, and sure, there are Christian preachers who really mess this up, but our Christianity is not about what you pay or the influence you peddle or the political positions you occupy. It's simply about approaching God's throne of grace as poor, miserable sinners. And before we can even ask to be saved, God gives us the riches of salvation. He opens the gates of heaven for us now. If you were a, I don't know, if you were a hotel and innkeeper, And you might let one person in to spend the night after a rough day. You might have compassion on one person, but every single person who came by your inn, well, you'd be out of business. That would be a foolish thing to do. But that's just what God does. Every single person who has faith in Jesus Christ is called a child of God. No tithes or offerings. No good works, no sinner's prayer necessary. For we are saved by grace, through faith. It is a gift of God, a foolish gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the foolishness of God is stronger than men. Free gifts are more impactful and will save more people than a gift you have to pay for because neither you nor me nor anyone else, however wealthy or poor or rich or strong or powerful or influential, no one can pay to receive God's gifts. He gives them to us freely of himself, pouring out himself on that cross. Foolishness in the eyes of the world, sure. The world likes power. The world likes influence. Unfortunately, even people in the Christian church like power and influence, seeking to influence the political process to their own goals. It's not what God's all about. God is about taking up your cross and following him. Foolish in the eyes of the world. Wise in the eyes of God and the wisdom of God is much stronger than the foolishness of the world. 
Even the foolishness of God is, is, is stronger and more powerful, as the text says, than the wisdom of the world. And God's weakness stronger than man. What does this look like? Well, of course it looks like our salvation. We know that. You and I know that. It's a wonderful truth to know. But how can we live this truth out in our lives? St. Paul continues, For consider your own calling, brothers, and I add sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. I don't know about you, but I'm not descended from the Queen of England. I'm not in the royal succession to any throne that I know of. Wouldn't that be something if I was? I'm not. I know that I'm not. I'm not coming from great and extraordinary wealth, and my guess is that neither are you. Most people, by the very definition of it, most people are ordinary. And sometimes we think, well, it's not good enough to be ordinary. It's not good enough to be just one of the bunch. It's not good enough to be weak. We need to make something of ourselves, and that's fine. It's fine in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of God, that means nothing. Because over and over and over again in Scripture, who do we see God choose? Do we see God choosing King Herod or King Herod's son? Do we see him choosing the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Do we see him choosing the rich? Or do we see him choosing the poor? And the ordinary? Do we see him choosing the weak? And not just Jesus, even in the early church, the early church at Corinth, not many of you, St. Paul writes, were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. That's okay. For God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. We see great pictures of this coming out of the 1960s. Think of Rosa Parks, ordinary woman, To be sure, there was nothing inherently extraordinary about Rosa Parks. But this ordinary woman simply took a seat on the bus. And she, in that ordinary, wise foolishness, made all those people who suddenly threw up a fit that, my goodness, I can't sit down on this bus. They made them all look like fools. And we look at them like fools even this day. Soft answer turns away wrath. Ordinary people can make a difference. Ordinary people acting in a way that the world would think as foolish can indeed make fools out of the wise and shame them. That's not what we're all about. We're not always about bringing down the powerful. We're not always about bringing down the haughty, but even in our own lives and in our own world. The world says you can't make a difference because you don't have this many followers on Facebook or this many subscribers on YouTube or this many people retweeting you or this many people watching you dance on TikTok world says you can't make a difference if you're not those things. God says otherwise. Consider your own calling, brothers and sisters. If God, consider your own calling. God shows what is low and despised in the world. In other words, God shows me and he shows you to change the world. To bring to nothing the things that are. It's not necessarily talking about people. Maybe it's talking about fear. There are a lot of people facing fear now. 
Maybe it's talking about someone who is struggling with addiction or troubles with body image. Maybe it's talking about someone who's hearing the call of the streets. What does this look like? Does this look like becoming a social media star? No, it doesn't, because Jesus Christ certainly was not. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, let alone a YouTube channel. Living as Jesus did in this case, living foolishly, looks like giving a hug. Oh yes, I know COVID. Giving a hug to your neighbor who has been so alone over over this past year now. Living foolishly looks like supporting your daughter who's struggling with bullying or maybe is a survivor of assault or maybe is struggling with body image. Living foolishly looks like helping out your grandson who is hearing that call to go on the streets and go and gangbang. God chose what is low and despised in the world to bring to nothing the things that are. God chooses you. God chooses you this day. And it is foolish to choose someone who isn't a TikTok star, a celebrity, a YouTube influencer. Thanks be to God that God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. A marketer would say, we don't go to ordinary people, we go to influencers. God says, I go to ordinary people. God says, I go to the person watching this broadcast this day. God says that I go to the people in the pews at Resurrection Lutheran Church and through them, each one of them reaching one, remember that, Resurrection people, each one reach one. I choose you, God says, to change the world. One soul at a time. Because I chose or I sent one soul, my son Jesus Christ. And if he had only died for one other soul, that would have been enough. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. We do this by God's strength, not our own, but by God's. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God has made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Dear Christian friends, we got something to boast about. And it's not what we've done. It's not our pocketbooks. It's not the cars that we drive. It's not the fact that we've made it. It's the fact that we have a Savior. It's the fact that God chooses to use each one of us to reach just one more. It's the fact that God chooses us to change the world because in his foolish wisdom, he chose one man not first to change the world, but to change one other person, and that person is you. Changes your life by forgiving your sin, by forgiving all those times that you have failed to put others first and to put him first. God changes the world by reminding you that you don't go alone, by baptizing you, by sending the Holy Spirit to dwell within you, by giving you his good gifts, feeding you with his word, feeding you with his sacrament. God changes the world by sending you out. By sending you out. What a foolish plan that is, isn't it? By sending one person, not an army, but by sending you. But thanks be to God, 
That's how the world changes. It's through you, dear Christian friend. So go this day. You got something to boast about. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. And the world will call you foolish. The world will call you foolish for going to church in person or online. The world will call you foolish for still believing. When they say, well, you don't need God. You don't need to believe in all this. We have so much other knowledge now. That's what the world calls foolishness. But it is the people of God who change the world. It is the people of God who have brought about more change, more positive change in the history of the world than all those mockers and scoffers. So, Christian friend, I'll leave you with this. Be foolish today. Be foolish and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be foolish and put all your faith, hope, and trust in Christ Jesus. Be foolish and let him work in you to change the world. Be foolish because God was foolish in saving you. Be foolish and be at peace with God a peace which passes all understanding, keeping your hearts and minds on Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord our God, you have brought us out of slavery to sin through Christ Jesus, whom you have made to be our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Bless all those whom you send to preach Christ crucified to us, that we may ever know and live in the truth of your power in his cross. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, whose steadfast love in Christ is good, turn in your abundant mercy to all those who suffer in our midst, that the flood may not sweep over them, nor the pit close its mouth on them. Deliver them from sinking into the mire and the deep waters, and grant them healing, comfort, and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, you bless this day and make it holy with your word and the gifts of your altar. Grant us to come before you in humble repentance to eat your son's body and blood, that we may not boast in ourselves in your, of ourselves in your presence, but in Christ alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, as three days after the temple of your son's body was destroyed by wicked men, he raised it up again. Grant that on the last day we and all the saints who now rest in your presence may share in the glory of his resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Our closing hymn this day is a new one, The Tree of Life. Please sing along. The tree of life with every good In Eden's holy orchard stood And of its fruit so pure and sweet God let the man and woman eat. Yet in this garden also grew another tree of which they knew. Its lovely limbs with fruit adorned against whose eating God had warned. The stillness of that sacred grove was broken as the serpent strove. With tempting voice Eve to beguile, and Adam to by sin defile. O day of sadness when the breath of fear and darkness, doubt and death, its awful poison first displayed within the world so newly made. What mercy God showed to our race, a plan of rescue by his grace. In sending one from woman's seed, the one to fill our gracious need. For on a tree uplifted high, his only son for sin would die would drink the cup of scorn and dread to crush the ancient serpent's head. Now from that tree of Jesus' shame flow life eternal in his name. For all who trust and will believe, salvation's living fruit receive. And of this fruit so pure and sweet, the Lord invites the world to eat. To find within this cross of wood the tree of life with every good. It's great to be with you today, beginning your day and your week with God, uh, and I hope that you'll pass this video along to uh, those around you. It might seem foolish to share the word of God on social media, even to share something from your church, but remember, the foolishness of God is much wiser than the wisdom of the world. A couple of things coming up this week. A Bible study, of course, released every Tuesday. I usually get to post on Facebook. Sometimes I forget, but it's certainly on our YouTube channel for anyone to watch. Um, that's uploaded Tuesday nights. Wednesday, uh, the our next midweek service is right here at Resurrection. 7 o'clock in the evening on uh, this coming Wednesday. It'll also be streamed online. Pastor Howell from St. Paul, Dorchester will proclaim the word. and He's one of my favorite preachers in this area, so I hope that you will either be here in person and hear the choir sing and do some fellowshipping with us or certainly be there online. 
to hear the word of God as Pastor Howell will bring it on our march toward Easter. Now, a couple of other things coming up. Uh, looking ahead toward Easter, uh, we've got an altar with no flowers on it today. If you would like flowers, all you have to do is contact Pat Israel in the office or talk to me, and uh, we'll, make, we'll, we'll see what we can do about, um, about you helping us getting flowers on the altar. But for Easter, how about Easter lilies? I've never had an Easter here at Resurrection yet, because last Easter, we were in the middle of the lockdown. So this will be really my first Easter in person as a pastor. And we're going to have Easter lilies. So if you'd like to have an Easter lily just like you do a Christmas poinsettia, all you have to do is um, give Pat or, um, or call or me a call and we will work that out too. For now, God bless you, be with you, and go with you. Know that you are called to be in the eyes of the world foolish people. That means that you are wise in the eyes of God. For you have embraced forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation through what Jesus Christ has done for you. So God, go with you this day and every day. See you along the line soon. Bye-bye.